classic Zoom problem, muted myself right at the beginning of the live stream. Welcome to Lunch with California Common Cause, our weekly opportunity for us to chat with our members and others interested in building a better and more inclusive California democracy. I'm Jonathan Metha Stein, the Executive Director at California Common Cause. I hope you're hanging in there. Uh, we have clean air here in uh, the Bay Area, at least for the time being. There are new fires in the North Bay and uh, our heart goes out to everyone who's impacted. We have staff in the North Bay and their family who are impacted. And so um, it's a difficult time uh, because of the fires. Um, I hope you and yours have the strong arms around you that you need. Um, we have a great guest today. Um, so I'm gonna keep my introduction very, very short. Election day is five days from yesterday, which means five weeks from, uh, five weeks from today, uh, this madness will be behind us and potentially a new madness will be starting. Um, I wanna remind everybody that election day night does not equal results night. Uh, results will take time. And so it will feel great to have the election behind us. I think, um, I think everyone should settle in for a dispute over election results that might take us through Thanksgiving and beyond. Vote by mail ballots in California will be sent out by county elections officials by October 5th. In some counties, they've already been sent if you want to know when your ballot is on your on its way to your mailbox, sign up for ballot tracks. You can get email or text updates from the Secretary of State and from your county elections office about the status of your mail ballot. That's available at wheresmyballot.sos.gov. I've signed up, it took me five minutes. Again, wheresmyballot.sos.gov. I'm gonna get text and email updates on the status of my vote by mail ballot. When it's on its way to me, and also after I vote it, put it in the mail and when it's on its way back to the county elections office. Okay, lots more to say, of course, about the election. We talked about it last week when we talked about Prop 17 um, and the battle for voting rights for Californians on parole. Lots more to say next week and the weeks to come. But for now, I wanna cut that short and save as much time as possible for our guest, Senator Ben Allen, who has represented California's 26th district in the state Senate since 2015. A native of Santa Monica, Senator Allen now represents his hometown in the legislature, along with much of the West Side and South Bay regions of Los Angeles County. Senator, welcome. Good to see you, Jonathan. Good to see you. Um, you have accomplished a ton in your career. We're so thrilled to have you. How does it feel to finally make it to lunch with California Common Cause? <laughs> this is... This is definitely the highlight of the week for sure. Yeah, I would think so. I'm kidding, of course. Um, uh, Senator Allen and I have known each other for close to 10 years, I think, with a history that is probably, I would say, too idiosyncratic to really be worth sharing. But suffice to say, we, a good one, I went to Berkeley. You really think the people are interested? I went to Berkeley Law. Senator Allen went to Berkeley Law. And while we're at Berkeley Law, we're both involved in many of the same activities. Is that a fair summary? It is. It is. Jonathan and I were both at different years. Um, the student member of the Board of Regents for the, for the University of California, which is, I think, for both of us, a fascinating and really meaningful experience. Yeah, it was a, an opportunity to, to tell billionaires they were wrong about a lot of stuff and then get outvoted for two years. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, Senator Allen, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, let me start by saying some very nice things about you that are probably going to make you uncomfortable. Um, Senator Allen is one of the most influential and most impactful California lawmakers in the democracy space over the last five years. He's authored a number of key bills um, that Common Cause backed on voting rights, on redistricting, on money in politics. Our work on uh, building a better California democracy has been his work since joining the legislature five years ago. Um, and actually, as recognition of his work in this space, California Common Cause actually awarded Senator Allen, it's Democracy Defender Award in 2017, which I assume is the most prestigious award he's ever received. Um, okay, um, so Senator Allen, let's, can we start by just talking about how political money works its influence in the legislature? You're gonna have a firsthand experience with this that none of our other guests have ever had. The way, the way that political money influences the legislative process? Yeah, so I think everyday folks, here's my question. I think everyday folks think special interests make a donation to a candidate's campaign, or they, maybe they make an independent expenditure in support of a candidate. And like presto, they have access to that candidate if he or she is elected. But I think in fact, the way that money works, the way that lobbying works is much more subtle than that. 
Can you maybe share an example of how special interest money actually yeah. gets outcomes in the legislative process? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's one that I'm grappling with all the time in this job, to be honest. And, and one, of the, one of the weird things is I think a lot of people think, oh, you raise money to first run for office. And so many of you perhaps have donated to a candidate when they're first, you know, come stepping forward to run for office. And then once they win, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, they, they tip, most incumbents, for example, don't really have to run tough races. You would think that they wouldn't have to spend all this time raising money. Um, and of course, that's exactly when the special interests really kick in. It's it's when they, you know, they they recognize the fact that there's a lot of, the, 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 there continues to be a lot of pressure on the members to raise money. And it's, and, and of course, regular people aren't typically giving to members who have easy reelections. And they end up wielding that power in a way that is, I think, kind of pernicious. I mean, these are companies that have not, that have made a lot of money, become very powerful uh, by not, by, by, by only spending their money wisely. And they, for some reason, they've made a determination that this is a good way for them to spend their money. And um, it's not as simple as what you, right. It's, it's, it's not the kind of thing where, you know, someone writes a check and then all of a sudden they get support. But uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a whole system in place to try to influence, to cajole, to befriend, to push, to pull, to punish legislators who, you know, to, to go in the direction of what's called the third house, which is a terrible thing if you think about it. I mean, that, that's a reference to the fact that we have two houses of the legislature, the Senate and the Assembly, and there's this, there's this proverbial third house, which is basically the lobby corps that has help to finance that beautiful row of gla glass buildings that are uh, to the north of the Capitol in Sacramento. Um, you know, I, I, right now I'm in the middle of a, of a whole kind of protracted battle over Proposition 24, which is this privacy initiative that a lot of people are confused about or have different opinions about. And yeah. there's a lot of good yeah. friends who are opposed to it. And one of their major arguments is, well, this is something that the legislature should take care of. And I don't disagree with that, but part of what got me to the place where I now support the proposition is because to be honest, I don't have a ton of faith that the legislature has the requisite independence to act mm -hmm. as, 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 as independently as folks out in the general public would want. By the way, this is not a new phenomenon. I and mean, the reason why Hiram Johnson set up the, you know, this whole system for going to, directly to the voters you know, back in the progressive era was because at the time, the legislature was bought and sold by the railroad industry and others. And unfortunately, that, that influence continues. The members feel the need to raise money to give to their caucus. That, those caucus donations help to determine what chairmanships you get, you know, the size of your staff, the office you get, your place within the caucus, the power that you have. Uh, and it's, it's kind of pathetic. And, and to be honest, it's really part of why I really so value and treasure the fact that we've got organizations like Common Cause out there, California Clean Money Campaign, League of Women Voters, other groups, and Common Cause is very central to this effort. That, that's that casting a different perspective on these things that actually, you know, it spends a lot of time thinking about the pernicious influence of money over the process. And I just see how it influences things all the time. I see members, I had a member, I, I was working on a big environmental bill and I had a member explicitly tell me that he couldn't vote for this plastics bill that I was, uh, that I'm working on because this one major styrofoam manufacturer that happens to give him a very regular check every, every election cycle uh, you know, opposes the bill, so he can't oppose it. So every once in a while, you get people who are that open and honest about how much they're influenced by the money. Um, you know, maybe the jobs too. But 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 the, but in some respects, the scarier thing is when you really know that's what's going on behind the legislators' ears, you know, in their mind. But but they they will they'll never want to admit it to you, and they'll come up with all sorts of talking points and lines that you know were force fed to them by the lobbyists who who do donate a lot of money to them, and and. Um, it's pernicious. It's a problem. It's one of the reasons why we're all so anxious to overturn Citizens United and all of its progeny or its, or its ancestry. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I just am grateful for the fact that there's so many Californians who contribute to and engage in and help to raise up the work of common cause. You said the word punish earlier, and I was actually listening to an interview you did with Jessica Levinson on a, her podcast. I will recommend that to anyone. Uh, Jessica is a, a law professor and a leading expert on the common causes issues. I would really recommend her podcast generally, but specifically the episode with Senator Allen. And you told a story, I don't know if you want to share it again, but a story of essentially being, you know, uh, quasi punished. I mean, slapped on the wrist by a, a, a lobbying group um, because you asked questions. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? I think it was really illustrative of how sort of power works in the Capitol. 
Yeah, it was a, so it was a weird little, it was a weird bill. It was a bill um, that had been authored by Lorena Gonzalez. And it basically reopened the statute of limitations for, um, for cases relating to uh, sexual abuse uh, with kids. So incredibly, incredibly sensitive issue. I mean, I mean, this is something that nobody wants to be associated with. Nobody, you know, everyone wants to be super um, sensitive to. You know, and I'm a former school board member. And so for me, um, one, of the, one of my challenges when I'm always serving on a lot, of, a lot of issues is that I'm always thinking about what sort of impact a bill might have on my own local school district that I, you know, I served on a board. We were constantly being sued. We were constantly being challenged. Uh, I, I come from a very engaged community and a lot of lawyers in my community. And so, you know, my, all, I, all, all that happened was my, I had a staffer who asked a few questions about the impact this might have on school district budgets and the, you know, the interplay with, um, with, with education code. And, um, and next thing I know, literally within, within five or six hours of my staffer, I didn't even ask these questions. And, and you know, to be honest, I'd actually voted for a similar bill in the past. Within about five or six hours of my staffer asking questions of another staffer, of another legislative staffer, there was a video that had been produced by one of the consultants for the sponsors of the bill, which is basically a front group for some, for some trial lawyers uh, that, was, that basically said, you know, the only thing worse than sexual offenders are the people who try to cover up for them. And it had an image of me. And this got sent out to a whole bunch of members of the California Democratic Party convention. It was a very weird experience. And, and a lot of my friends were writing me and saying, what's this all about? And it was just, but it was, it was a, and I found out later, partly it was a way of trying to send a signal to any legislators to be afraid of challenging anything associated with this bill. Apparently the consultant uh, sent it to the governor's office as well, because he was trying to bully the governor into sort of accepting the bill as is without any amendments, without any changes. And it was just an example of how quickly things can get ratcheted up. And, and by the way, one of the things that made me think about a lot too, is that Oftentimes you have groups, I mean, I'm just getting a lot of mail right now, uh, you know, over, for some reason, I'm somehow on the mailing list of this assembly race that's going on down in South LA, where the, the prison guards are attacking Reggie Jones Sawyer, because yeah. they don't like his position on criminal justice reform, but they're attacking him and somehow I'm getting the mail. I don't live in his district. I live in Santa Monica, but I think because I'm a democratic person, they, they, they put me on the mailing list. So, so we can, so we basically can be warned that don't mess with us. Right. So, so I just got a mail piece, which was attacking Reggie Jones Sawyer for taking money from the tobacco industry. And of course it, the interesting thing is that the whole thing is being paid for by the prison guards union. So, you know, oftentimes politicians will get attacked for things that have nothing to do with the reasons why they're being attacked. Uh, and, and it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a warning slap, right? It's, 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 as you say, Jonathan, it's, it's, it's basically a way that the special interests, the power groups, and everyone engages in this, whether it be the you know, business interests or labor unions or trial law organizations. And they basically try to you know, slap down legislators who ask too many questions, who oppose their positions. And, and, um, and it's, a, it's a, once again, another pernicious and dangerous aspect of the, of the legislative sausage making process. So I actually have a bunch of additional questions about the sausage making process, but I'm gonna skip them for the interest of time because I want to talk about some of the work you've done, the really important work you've done in our field. Um, so I'm going to start with voting. You authored SB 450 in 2016, also known, more commonly known as the Voters' Choice Act, which gave counties the option to move to the vote center model. Um, counties could mail every ballot, mail every voter a ballot, and then open a smaller number of in-person voting sites, but those smaller number of sites have to have more services. They have to offer same-day voter registration. They have to be open for multiple days of early voting. They also have to offer drop boxes. Some people called that the future of voting in California. And I actually think that's been proven true by the fact that it, to adjust to voting amid a pandemic, California is essentially offering every county the opportunity to use a diet version of the Voters' Choice Act. And I think most counties are going to use that. So Senator Brown, you joined the Senate in 2015. By 2016, one year later, you were authoring a bill that might end up remaking how California votes. How did all of that come together so quickly? Yeah, so we were coming out of the 2014 election, which had been record low turnout in the state of California. It was pathetic. I mean, the, the, um, the, 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 the lack of engagement, the lack of participation, really, I think, sent shockwaves through, through the legislature and, and through the political class. Because in the end of the day, you know, as uh, those of us who actually want to do the right thing really do care about ensuring that our political system is truly reflective of the will of the people. And, um, 
And, and, and so when we have such low voter participation, it really becomes uh, a problem to, to, to feel as though we have a popular mandate that is really truly public accountability. And so, and of course, this was also layered on the fact that a lot of states, particularly down south, and I think we're seeing the impact of this now, we certainly saw the impact of it in the 2018 election. A lot of other states were actually taking pains to try to make it more difficult to vote. And, and, and that, of course, has led to the, you know, the effective uh, disenfranchisement, or at least the, the under-enfranchisement of a lot of poor folks, communities of color, uh, in a lot of, of places in the, in, in the country. And so we were trying to figure out ways, how do we make it more convenient to vote? The world is changing, right? You know, at the end of the day, this whole model that we have to vote on one day between two hours on, in one location, just doesn't jibe with the with the, the life of, of normal folks. I got a little baby, for example. I mean, you know, I, we, we're, my wife and I are working parents. Uh, you know, all my friends are, are in that situation. I mean, people are moving around. People um, have difficult time, um, you know, just coping with their daily schedule, let alone carving out some additional time on a Tuesday to go and cast a ballot. And so our idea was, how do we make it easier? How do we make it more convenient while also protecting the integrity of the process? And we started studying other, other states and we looked at Oregon and Washington, where they have, I mean, Oregon, for example, has had 100% vote by mail for many years, and it's worked well. But we went to Colorado, and we liked the fact that Colorado had this hybrid model. I actually drive a Chevy Volt, right? It's a hybrid. I, I get to plug it in, and if I run out of my electric charge, I can always rely on the gas. And so the nice thing about what we saw in Colorado is that, yes, everybody gets a vote by mail ballot, and they're able to participate that way if they want to. But there's also vote centers, so people can participate in person. They can drop off their ballot. I had a drop box, they can drop off their ballot at the vote center, they can vote in person in the vote center. And the great thing is, under our model, which we've now, you know, adopted, people can vote in the vote center anywhere in the county. So, you know, for example, last time around 20, you know, at the, during the primary election, my wife and I went and saw a show downtown, we went and saw um, a show, you know, in, at the music center. And, you know, there happened to be a, a vote center, uh, we went on, I think, on a Sunday, and election day was Tuesday. And so we just went over to the Hall of Administration and voted there. Super easy. We live in Santa Monica. We got it done, you know, within about 10 minutes and, and do just because we happen to be downtown. If we'd been in Silmar or Downey or Santa Monica or Manhattan Beach or Redondo, we could have voted in a vote center there, too. And it was just it was so nice to be able to have the convenience of this system. So that's that's how we got to this. It's about flexibility. It's about convenience. It's, it's about providing voters with with different options to be able to cast a secure vote. How did you get pulled into this in your first year in, in, in the legislature? I mean, there were other more established people, right, who, who had been there for years and years and years. You took on this massive bill essentially in your first year. Like, what's that? What's the story there? Yeah, well, you know, I got to give uh, Kevin DeLeon, who is the pro tem, the Senate pro tem, a lot of credit. I was the chair of the elections committee. He made me the chair of the elections committee right out the gates. We had a nice conversation when I first got started, and I guess he saw in me um, a little bit of a spark for this kind of election nerd stuff. And I think he, he saw in me uh, someone who really wanted to get my get my get into this issue. And, and, and I, I love this stuff. I, I, I think elections and, and, the, and the voting processes and election integrity are so important and so fascinating. And he also as somebody who represents, he represented a pretty poor community and a, and a high a community with a lot of people of color. And he really was concerned about making sure that we, we took some more action and make voting easier because that ultimately really does help more disenfranchised, more disadvantaged communities. We had a long conversation and he said, Ben, I think you're the right guy to do this. I, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to trust you to take the leadership role. And I ended up working very closely with his office and, and, and a number of others. And obviously Senator Hertzberg ultimately also got very involved and it became a really great effort. But I, I give a lot of credit to Kevin DeLeon for, uh, for well, and not just credit, but I, I have a lot of gratitude toward Kevin for his uh, for his faith in me and his hard and, and and the collaboration that we engaged in to get this done. Uh oh, where did Jonathan go? Uh oh, Nicole, can you? Uh oh, there's Jonathan's internet. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll keep chatting about it until he until he gets back up. Yeah, right. it looks like we lost him. Uh oh. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll I'll just let people know a little bit more about it. I mean, basically, um, L.A. County uh, uh, did have some issues with it back in in March, and I think some folks, you know, on the call certainly know about that. There were long lines. There were tech problems, and I will say, um, you know, that really did raise a lot of concerns for me. 
um, you know, LA County, you know, implemented the program um, and they, they did, they, they tried to do too much at once from my perspective. And we did give a lot of faith to the registrar in LA County. Um, they had this brand new voting system. They had an electronic poll book to check in voters. And, and one of the things was they had a lot of technical issues with these poll books. They were used to check in the voters, basically creating a, you know, linchpin and significantly slowing down the voting process. Um, the interesting thing is on the same day, you know, counties across the state had a really smooth process. You know, I, I'll never forget, I was in Sacramento actually the day, the day of and the day after the election because I voted, you know, at the, at the, at the Hall of Administration in, in downtown over the weekend. And I was back up in Sacramento. And I remember we have a lounge in the Senate where they have all the newspapers from all over the state. And of course the LA Times was screaming about how things had gone poorly in LA. And right next to it was the San Francisco Chronicle that had literally the lead, the lead headline of the Chronicle was, you know, election goes smoothly, uh, election day goes very smoothly. And so there were a lot of challenges in the way that LA County implemented the program. Um, a lot of it was technical in nature. Some of it was the fact that they, you know, they, they just really weren't prepared to deal with the fact that especially during this primary, there was just a mad rush of people late in the day on election day, which actually makes a lot of sense for a primary, especially given the fact that we'd moved the primary to March, that we didn't know what was happening with the election. At that point, it was very unclear as to who was gonna be the Democratic nominee. Bernie Sanders had been in lead in California, but then all, the, all of a sudden in South Carolina, uh, you know, Joe Biden, after having you know, pretty dramatically, you know, pretty systematically lost the, both the New Hampshire and the Iowa primaries, then uh, you know, got to a place where he was, he was, um, you know, about was 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 you know won South Carolina, and then all the you know Buttigieg and Klobuchar got behind Biden, and, and all of a sudden he became the guy. Uh, so it was it was a chaotic day, no question about it. Um, and LA County really, I think, made some major mistakes in the rollout. Um, you know, we've been we've been we've been really uh, watching them uh, and pushing them. My my big advice to everybody, you know, especially with all of the crazy things that are happening nationally and the extent to which the president is talking down election integrity, is please, you know, if you are going to vote in person, sorry, sorry, if you're going to vote by mail, please vote early, um, and 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 just in general, to the extent that you feel comfortable, take advantage of the early voting. You can vote early by mail. You can vote early by dropping off your ballot at a drop box. You can vote early in one of the vote centers. We're going to have vote centers, some of which are going to be open for 11 days before Election Day, um, others that will be open four days before Election Day. So there's nothing, you know, I think most of us have made up their mind, our minds about who we're going to vote for. Uh, so take advantage of the fact that instead of having an Election Day, we kind of have an Election Week, in fact, an Election Month in the state of California. Vote early, get your votes in, get those counted so that your vote will be part of the Election Night uh, vote count. Um, every vote will be counted in the state of California as long as it's postmarked by election day. But, but at least for, from optics perspective, because of all the chaos at the national level, I would just say it's important uh, to vote early. Thanks, Senator Allen. Um, I want to move to redistricting. So we're on the middle. We're in the middle of the redistricting cycle. California Common Cause is deeply embedded in that work. Um, our state citizens redistricting commission is ramping up, uh, but fewer people know that local redistricting is also ramping up. Um, and we're working on creating uh, independent redistricting commissions in a number of cities and counties. Um, and the fact that we're able to fight for independent redistricting commissions in cities and counties at all is because of a Senator Allen bill from 2016, SB 1108. That allowed cities and counties for the first time to create independent citizen-run redistricting commissions, taking redistricting out of the hands of politicians and putting in the hands of the people. And so I guess a similar question to you, you would just joined the state legislature. Presumably you've got a ton of things that you want to accomplish. You have a, people probably don't know this. You have a fixed number of bills that you're allowed to introduce. So every time you run a bill, you're not allowed to run another bill, right? You, you, you're crowding out another idea. You went to the redistricting well right away and then did it again, actually, with other redistricting bills afterwards. What motive, what led to you coming to the legislature ready to dive deep on redistricting, particularly mid-decade when very few people were thinking about it? Because I, I, I got to tell you, Jonathan, I think that the way that redistricting, the, the way that districting works around the country is one of the biggest problems that we have as a democracy. You know, the, the fact, I think if you look at our political system, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out how is it that we get to a place where we're so polarized that we get a guy, that we have a, we have a political system that incentivizes the sort of behavior that we're seeing out of the president and, we're, and that also incentivizes the sort of support 
that uh, the kind of blind support that 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 people within his party feel the need to give to him. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that the people who really are calling the shots in this country are partisan voters who vote during partisan primaries in gerrymandered districts. So in the end of the day, the fact that John Boehner, who was considered was considered too centrist to be Speaker of the House, to me just shows how screwed up the entire House representative system is. The fact that in most states, politicians get to draw their own lines. So they're basically protecting their districts in a way that try to maximize partisan benefit and partisan gain. And then of course they have partisan primaries. And so from my perspective, when you give politicians the power over drawing their own lines, it leads to a very self-serving process that leads to outcomes and incentives that are not in the broader public interest. I'm all for, I mean, if, 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 if I represent a left-wing community or a right-wing community, I think it's totally appropriate for that community to send a conservative or a progressive to the legislature. That's, that's not my problem. What, what, what I do have a problem with is when the system is so manipulated to, to benefit one party or another. And it's certainly, by the way, I mean, I don't mean to just cast stones at the, at the Republicans. The Democrats have engaged in partisan gerrymandering as well in some states in the past. Uh, but, but I want to make sure the system is, is, is more representative of our, of our broader population and of our public. And I think that the, 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 the partisan gerrymandering that dominates so much of the districting process in so much of the country is an anathema to, to, uh, to, to the, the development of a democratic system that is truly representative. And that's, I've believed that for a long, long time. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to jump into this uh, from the beginning when I got into the Senate. You know, I think our listeners actually would be really interested in knowing what your process is for deciding what bills to carry and what bills not to carry. I mean, you you do have a, a limited number of bills. In fact, in 2020, the bills were limited. Even, the number of bills, I believe, was limited even further because the legislature knew it was working remotely. Um, it was going to have less capacity to move legislation. Uh, and in fact, in the last day of the legislative session, a number of bills that people thought were going to pass actually didn't pass only because the legislature ran out of time. Um, so that is to say, you're operating in a constrained environment. And some people probably would criticize the legislature for introducing too many bills. Um, but how do yep. you and how does your office go through the process of deciding what bills you want to carry with that limited um, that limited portfolio that you have? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, so, so there's so some of it is self-generated, right? So I'll read an article in the newspaper that gets me all fired up. I want to do something about this issue. Or I'll have an idea that I've been thinking about for a long time that I want to work on. Sometimes that'll be a staff member who will be fired up about something. Oftentimes, or, or it could be a constituent uh, who I meet at an event or sends in an idea. Um, we also hear from interest groups in Sacramento who are shopping around bills. And they, you know, for them, they're oftentimes, you know, they just as soon go to me or someone else. Uh, and I'm, you know, we always listen to them and we, we hear them out. Um, I will say I have learned over the years that um, sometimes it's important, you know, even if you have the best idea, if you don't have any backup from any kind of group, and whether it be common cause, I mean, for example, if I'm going to if I'm going to do an election reform issue, I'm going to make sure that we talk to you guys. I'm going to make sure we talk to a couple others, uh, legal women voters, uh, clean money campaign. I mean, those are probably my, 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 my three, but the common cause really more than anyone, to be honest, uh, just to make sure that you feel comfortable with the bill that you might actually be willing to give it a little bit of muscle. Because running a controversial bill all on your own with no outside support is a much more difficult thing than if you have outside support. I've, I've learned the hard way. I, I, I get, I have, I've had ideas that I thought were really cool. And uh, without, you know, the, the kind of the, 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 the folks like you, Jonathan, and, and Nicholas and others who are working the halls and trying to engage with, with legislators or, and also constituents and members of the organizations who are doing the same, it just makes it a lot more difficult if it's a, if it's a bill that's controversial. So I look at how much do I care about the issue? How baked is the idea? Um, we also oftentimes will run the ideas by committee staff. Sometimes I'll maybe run them by a legislator or two who has a certain amount of gravitas in that policy area. And then we'll also find out like who's going to line up in support and who's going to line up in opposition. And you know, and how many big bills do we have in a year? Maybe one year we, we're working so hard on this environmental thing. God, I could take on this other bill, but it's going to be such a big fight. Oh, and by the way, so Senator so and so is interested. Well, let's let you know him or her take it. I'll back them up. I'll become a co-author of that bill. I'll support their efforts, and and you know, and similarly, they'll support my efforts on this other thing. So it's a bit of a dance. Uh, it's an analysis. You 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 really kind of put out. It's like a SWOT analysis of sorts, where you look at 
your strengths, your, your internal capacity? Do we have the staffing, especially on a controversial bill to really be able to take it across the finish line? Is there a media strategy that can help take across the finish line? Um, so it's actually quite a, quite a few factors that go into determining whether we take a bill on or not. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. So we talked about SB 450, um, the Voter's Choice Act, which passed in 2016. We talked about um, SB 1108, which enables cities and counties to use independent review commissions, also passed in 2016. 2016 was a huge year for you. Are you concerned at all that it's all downhill since then? That was not a serious question. I was, I was actually, I actually meant to ask, having passed a bunch of big bills on like voting rights, redistricting money and politics, early in your tenure, what are your biggest priorities now? Are you still, what are you shifting to? Well, I mean, I've, I've, I continue to be very interested in this broader issue of money and politics and, 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 and voting rights. Voting rights has been an easier space to work in in such a democratic dominated legislature. Money and politics, a little trickier. Um, yeah. We've sometimes had to really wrestle with um, a lot of the interest groups. I mean, a lot of my colleagues, as I mentioned, are a, a little too beholden to the logic of of lobbying and, 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 and political money. And, and, you know, the Democratic, I mean, one of the great challenges that you and I had when we were trying to get some of the Disclose Act bills through was 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 grappling with the labor folks, you know, who are uh, tend to be more progressive on a lot of policy issues, but, you know, also take, we're certainly taking advantage of the existing, um, you know, disclosure laws or lack thereof when it yeah. came to running independent expenditures and the rest. And so they, that was a real struggle. It was part of why those bills were tough to pass over time, in spite of the fact that there was such a strong Democratic majority in the legislature. Um, you know, I guess I'm, I, I'm also really passionate about environmental protection. And I mean, for my, for my, what I'm actually, I think what you'll find is I find myself really attracted to those efforts that don't have a lot of strong vested interests that are fighting the fight. Um, you know, I, 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 and I see that on the environment. I see that both on election reform and money in politics. And I see that on the environment. And in, in the end of the day, there, the environment is something that actually engenders the support of a lot of the public but there's not a lot of big money behind getting aggressive, strong, good environmental bills through the legislature. And unfortunately, I, I experienced that in a pretty big way. I mean, I thought, and I know you were making a joke, but yeah, I mean, I, I had a big bill that two years in a row, we couldn't get across the finish line. It had to do with, with plastic waste and basically phasing out non-recyclable single-use plastics. And we just came, we got the bill out of the Senate. We came within inches of getting it out of the assembly. We had 37 votes when we needed 41. And it was just, it, you know, it, it just was, it got, it got a barrage of industry lobbying from oil, from the big plastics folks, from a lot of manufacturing people who were just trying to kill this bill under all circumstances. And so, and ultimately, as much as I love my, my friends from the environmental community, there's just not enough juice there, right? There, there's just not enough, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're totally, their arguments are based on moral persuasion. I had the support of the cities too, because, you know, their budgets are getting hammered by by the, the, the collapse of the recycling market and the fact that China doesn't want our recycling anymore. But, but ultimately, you know, the power of the lobby, the lobbying core versus the cities and the environmental community just was too strong. And um, so those are, those are actually the kinds of things that I seek out. I think those are where we need people to stand up and just use the moral suasion of people power. But I've been disappointed a couple of times. And to be honest, I have to learn to be a better organizer. Of, of, of broader coalitions. And I think that's where groups like Common Cause and others come in. I mean, we really do need, you know, the only reason why we got the disclosed bills through that we got through, that were aggressive bills that were opposed initially by a lot of the special interests, including more progressive special interests, is because we had the people power behind Common Cause, behind the Clean Money Campaign, just hammering elected officials, calling in, pushing them, you know, showing up at local events and debates and town halls and just haranguing them into submission. And you know that ultimately that that does work sometimes. Not enough. That's democracy. It's important. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, you may know Ted Merman, who's a professor at UC Berkeley Law. Um, yeah. Ted is a consumer rights advocate, and and one of the observations he's made to me is the legislature is is great on civil rights and immigrant rights protection stuff like that, in part because there's no moneyed interest that yeah. opposes those bills. He's trying to fight on things to protect consumers yes. from banks and from credit card companies in the financial industry. And he's like, I can't move any of that legislation because I'm fighting a massive moneyed sector that can pour campaign donations and lobbying hours into fighting me. Um, so it really, if you're ever interested in, and so I'm speaking not to you, but to the public, like if you're interested in knowing why the legislature moves frequently in certain areas, it doesn't move in other areas. Um, you know, look at where the money lies. 
You're um, right. You're absolutely right. Alan, I, I, want to, I want to be respectful of your time. I want to, I want to, we've already gone over the amount of time we have with you. So thank you so much uh, for joining us um, and uh, for being a champion on, on money and politics, on redistricting, on voting rights. It's, it's a huge help um, to have just even a couple allies and champions in the legislature when we're trying to move our And I just got to say, I, it's a huge help to know that I can count on the partnership, allyship, engagement, expertise, and people power of organizations like Common Cause. And I just, I got to say, especially in a moment like this, this is a very worth, this, this, your work, the work of this organization is so important. And I just really encourage people to double down on their support for Common Cause. Yeah, I, you know, I was watching the presidential debate last night, if you want to call it that, and it really does feel like our democracy is in crisis. Um, and I think that for a lot of people, I, I can't blame them for looking at that and saying, this is the best democracy has to offer me, like I'm opting out. And I would just call on people, we need you more than ever. Like we right. just have to, our democracy feels broken right now, but the only thing that's going to fix it is us. And we just need you to double down your efforts to make this democracy work. Um, you can uh, you can follow uh, Senator Allen on Twitter at Ben Allen CA. He's also on Facebook, facebook.com slash Ben Allen California. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Common Cause CA. We're on Instagram at CA Common Cause. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter if you're interested at underscore Jonathan Stein. Um, next week, I'll be flying solo with one of our biweekly updates on what's going on in the California democracy space. As always, we appreciate you and your support of California Common Cause. Thank you for being with us in this fight. Senator Allen, thank you one last time for joining us on, again, um, California's preeminent uh, source of news, Lunch with California Common Cause. We'll see everyone next week. Thanks so much.